I'm Leslie Green Bowman. I think almost all of you know that uh, from the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, the current CEO and president. And we are really excited to host you tonight for this event and also very excited to host many more online. Thanks to an amazing digital team that sort of sprouted up overnight when we had to close now almost 20 months ago. And um, during that time, we've hosted 4 million views of programs online, including programs like this tonight, which is actually 10 times our normal on-site visitation in a year bef before the pandemic. So we've obviously begun to flex our muscles with virtual, and I think um, perhaps I will never again introduce a program at Monticello that doesn't have a virtual um, version, whether it's live streamed or whether it's taped, and then we um, we produce it. Um, and 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 I have to put in a plug if you really want to see how well the team did at a kind of amazingly high pressured situation. July fourth of twenty twenty, um, could it happen publicly? And this amazing digital team, Ian Bacham there behind the camera, Melody Boyer back there, the um, amazing magician who helped us have a live guided guided virtual tour the very first day we closed at March of 2020. I think these memories of the pandemic are gonna be with us always. But anyhow, tonight we are delighted to be together um, and on site and with an amazingly important and um, informative speaker, Andrew Roberts. Um, Andrew Roberts is an award-winning historian and he's written the first biography of King George III um, in 50 years. Now, like I said, there were some before that, but in the last five decades, no one has revisited. And there's new research and there's access to papers and things at Windsor Archives. So Andrew has combed through hundreds of thousands of pages of correspondence, um, much of it unpublished. The public would not have access to it on a normal basis to offer a much more nuanced portrait of this storied king and maligned monarch. So I say that because many of you might well go to your mental image that in pop culture in America is the most prominent one of late. And that would be George III as the spitting and pompous monarch in the Tony Award winning musical, Hamilton. <laughs> we even spooked that when our um, former chair, Don King, stepped down from office. Um, but we're thrilled to welcome you, Andrew, tonight. It is a great pleasure. You know, he actually um, it was kind enough to fit us in because he was he was doing a program in Washington, D.C. this afternoon. Um, so we're thrilled to welcome Andrew Roberts with our Andrew um, because they're going to have a conversation. And many of you know our Andrew is the closest thing to even a vignette biography on George III in 50 years because of his award-winning book, The Men who lost America. So let me turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Vice President and Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, Andrew O'Shaughnessy. Thank you. And uh, Andrew, thank you very much for coming. Congratulations on this wonderfully researched book. As you see, mine is a well-thumbed <laughs> copy, uh, but I have the demo version of the book about which more in a moment. Uh, it really is a pleasure to have you here as uh, one of Britain's best-known historians, if not the best-known uh, historian. Uh, he describes himself as an independent historian but he's held in such regard that he's a visiting professor at King's College London and their wonderful war department, a very impressive department, uh, and one of the few which really teaches military history. Uh, he's a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institute, where shortly after this, he's going to be hosted for a launch by Condoleezza Rice. Uh, he's also a trustee of the um, National Army Museum in Britain, and until recently, the National Portrait uh, Gallery. I must say, I thought I knew Andrew's career quite well until I 
really studied it in detail and realized just how much he's uh, written, which is really remarkable because it's all based on primary research, which he does himself. Uh, despite writing for a popular audience, uh, he doesn't cut corners. Uh, these books are very well footnoted. Uh, the, the footnotes are not consolidated, which is one way uh, many writers try and get around, nor does he have a team of uh, researchers. Um, he's perhaps best known and most highly regarded for his biography of Winston Churchill. He has a huge following here in the United States because of that biography, including, among others, by George W. Bush. I seem to remember you were invited to stay in the Lincoln Room. No, just to, to visit to the White House. Uh, he's done uh, a major biography recently of Napoleon, uh, the Earl of Halifax, uh, who was regarded as the possible contender to be prime minister against uh, Churchill, and also uh, Lord um, Salisbury. Uh, he's written uh, a sequel to Churchill's uh, History of the English-Speaking Peoples, book on the Second World War called The Storm of War, A New History of the Second World War, a book on leadership in war, and a novel, and I'm excluding many others. One of my favorite was your first eminent Edwardians, uh, which in some ways is a deliberate takeoff of Lytton Strachey's eminent uh, Victorians. Uh, it includes biographies of um, Earl Mountbatten and uh, I've always liked collective biography, incidentally, uh, and you've done several. Uh, and also, uh, Arthur Bryant, a historian, which was very revelatory, I must uh, say. Uh, I have to also add, uh, and this was very popular with some of my staff members, he is the NBC correspondent on the royal family. He covered both uh, Prince William's wedding and also Prince Harry's, uh, I think the last had a 30 million viewership, uh, and very considerable. Uh, he was uh, trained uh, at Gonville and Keyes College, uh, Cambridge University. I feel I have to mention that because I'm interested in founders of universities. And uh, they're the only university I know that has the skull of the founder of the wall, uh, <laughs> Dr. John Keyes. And it's also famous for the three gates that are meant to be, represent the passage of a student through a university, one of which is the gate of humility. But by remarkable coincidence, two nights ago, I found myself sitting next to an American who graduated at Gondolin Keys, I think about 20 or 30 years before you, insisted that there's a fourth uh, archway uh, that he described as necessitates, which was to the bathroom. <laughs> so let me begin by setting the scene rather than getting into the argument of the book. Um, and we, he asked to do this as an interview, and I must say I prefer that method myself. And he's very keen that we start the Q&A as early as possible, uh, but we'll first have a conversation. And I want to set the scene of... George III's public standing and his public uh, image. And when he ascends to the throne uh, in 1760, he's this very young man, very idealistic. Uh, he's very popular after one of the least popular of British monarchs, his grandfather, George II. But uh, as the public do, the sort of view of him very quickly began to sour, and long before the, English, the Americans were calling him a tyrant, the English were very uh, critical, um, and indeed Americans were deferential through the 1760s. Did you want to expand on that? Uh, and uh, you know, people like John Wilkes and Junius and so forth. I would very much, but before mm. I do, uh, yes. Andrew, I wonder if I could preface my remarks by saying what a complete delight it is to be mm. here, and thank you mm. very much indeed for your kind words. When my wife, um, uh, I was on my way here to this uh, to this book tour. It's a five-week mm. book tour, and she said, uh, 
So, darling, you're going to Monticello to sing the praises of Mad King George. And I said, yes. And uh, mm -hmm. she said, well, um, if you pull that off, King Herod is going to get in touch <laughs> in order to see whether or not you can help make him parent of the year. <laughs> um, to answer your question, uh, he started off with a uh, the king in uh, age 22 in, in 1760 when he became king with a um, an awful lot going for him, not least because he was the first king for about 150 years to have been born and bred in Britain. Um, he, uh, born and educated in this country, I, I glory in the name of Britain, was what he said to the uh, state opening of Parliament in 1761. And, and it was true. He, um, he didn't speak uh, English with a German accent like his father and his grandfather. Um, and his great-grandfather, George I, didn't even speak English at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was very much seen as a, uh, as, a, um, as a British king and the first one for a very long time. Um, and as you say, that soured. That soured mm -hmm. um, partly because he was in favour of the Treaty of Paris, which um, was considered the one that, came, that brought to an end the French and Indian Wars and was considered to be too kind to the French even though it gave us India, Canada, and all sorts, <laughs> all sorts of other nodal points around the, the empire. But he supported and he pushed it through. He also appointed his uh, former governor to, um, when he was a child, to the premiership, uh, Lord Bute, who was um, uh, a Scot. And there was a tremendous amount of bigotry, frankly, um, against the Scots because, of course, as recently as 1745, the Jacobite rebellion had got as far as Derby, only a few hundred miles away from, 150 or so miles away from London. And so Scots were held in, in great uh, sort of fear and execration still. And so he, in a sense, threw away very quickly his, um, his popularity. It came back enormously later, and I'm sure we'll yeah, get on to that later on. But, but, what, but the single most important reason that it collapsed was his attempt to um, arrest under seditious libel laws John Wilkes, the radical, um, the radical journalist, and and this had reverberations in America as well because it seemed like a kind of totalitarian thing to do. However, if there is an absolute definition of seditious libel, what John Wilkes was saying, which was that uh, George III's mother, Princess Augusta, was having an affair with the Prime Minister, uh, Lord, Lord Bute, has to actually um, define the sense of seditious libel. If you've got a law of seditious libel, which you did, then John Wilkes personified the kind of person that you should arrest under it. Um, but of course he shouldn't have been arrested ultimately because he was constantly re-elected to Parliament every single time that he um, was, uh, was found guilty by a court and therefore thrown out of Parliament, his constituents at Essex, um, sorry, Middlesex, um, re-elected him. And they did this four times in a row to the huge humiliation of the government and ultimately, of course, also the king. And the satires are merciless. And we talk about the press today and irresponsibility. And we talk about social media and yeah. conspiracy. Yeah. There is, yeah, if, you're looking really for, if you're looking for fake news, you go yes. to the late 18th century, don't you? With that <laughs> extraordinary, um, extraordinary way in which, not just, of course, with the written word, but also the caricatures. Yes. In a sense, George III was very unlucky because he also lived in the age. I have quite a lot of the caricatures in my, uh, in my book as the illustrations. The age of Isaac Cruikshank and, uh, and uh, Thomas... Rowlandson, James Gilray, you know, these, mm. these huge mm. figures who were able to um, sort of humiliate figures with the, uh, with the sort of beautiful artwork that they brought out. Now, I have the British edition of the book, uh, and it's a different picture on the cover. It's a different title. The American version is called The Last King of America, and this is something that's happened to both of us. Uh, uh, they're both, incidentally, beautifully illustrated, uh, and that's marvellous that you persuaded the publishers to put in colour. I didn't plates. persuade them, I paid a oh, vast right. amount of money. No, <laughs> I'm still paying, actually. I mean, it's, it's sort of adding to the mortgage, frankly. 
Yes. Um, the um, one day <laughs> uh, we also have to pay for the indexes. It's not going to be long before authors have to pay for the paper of the books yes. that, that we publish. But with regard to the front cover um, and the and the different title, mm. "The Last King of America," is obviously, with any luck, going to sell better in America than it would in, in England. So yes. um, unless you're trying to make a uh, a point here, uh, Andrew, <laughs> uh, it was um, it was a sensible thing to have done. I yes, think. no, I think so. Uh, <laughs> and you. British publishers will always say the British don't want to hear about the American Revolution. It was a defeat, uh, and so they often, uh, you know, they didn't at least change the contents of the book. No, no, uh, not a word. No, exactly. <laughs> and of course, it, of course, in a, I mean, it was the greatest catastrophe to overcome. <laughs> Uh, the the British between the loss of the Angevin lands in the 15th century and the uh, fall of France in 1940. Mm. So uh, so of course it's uh, um, it's devastating for um, the king at the time and also for his reputation uh, for the next 200 plus years. And we will get on to how his reputation was transformed later in life, um, but. Uh, what I want to focus on is, of course, your major argument. Was he uh, a tyrant or not? Um, and you might want to just tell us how the British political system was meant to work. I and mean, there's no doubt this calling him a tyrant is extremely exaggerated. Uh, the monarchy even got weaker in some ways, uh, partly because he commuted uh, crown lands so that he just got a fixed income voted by parliament, the number of placemen yes, and, and reduced. And also mm. the um, evolution of mm. the prime minister and the cabinet, yes. which both became much more powerful during his mm. long reign. Uh, partly, of course, this was due to the fact that in the last 10 years of his reign, he was, uh, he was insane. Mm. And so I mean, we'll, I'm sure we'll get on to, very uh, to, to his madness. But mm. Um, you had a powerful prime minister at the end of his life, William Pitt the Younger, mm. who um, he was willing to, and he trusted, and was willing to pass on um, uh, residual powers to. Mm. Um, and, and sort of the world was, was changing in a way that, uh, that the powers that he inherited under the Glorious Revolution of 1688, um, he passed on to his son, George IV, um, in vestigial sense, but not, I mean, he never, for example, um, vetoed an act of parliament, which he could have done theoretically if he'd wanted to. Only on one occasion did he appoint somebody, William Pitt the Younger, to uh, become prime minister who didn't have the support of the majority of the House of Commons. And that was subsequently vindicated in the next general election where Pitt won a landslide victory. So. You do have in George III somebody who is a true believer in the Constitution um, and, uh, and is not the figure that, understandably, the Founding Fathers needed to mm. present him as, as somebody who was a sort of Stuart absolutist who believed in the divine right of kings and so on. Why is it, though, that he, people insist that he is a tyrant? Uh, on both sides of the uh, Atlantic. I mean, you rightly point out he had very little to do with the policies that led to the revolution. Yeah. Uh, to some extent, he was fulfilling his constitutional role as supporting parliament. It was really parliament that was making the claims to tax America and so on. He was expected as the head of state to support parliament. Um, but why this this extreme language, which incidentally John Adams later said was wrong, that we should never have called him a, yes. a tyrant. Yes, no, and mm. I go into that a, a bit yes, in the book, do. Um, uh, Adams' uh, critique. Mm. Well, I think it was essential wartime propaganda. Mm. I mean, you can't have a war against a country and not denounce the, the king of that country. Mm. It, would, it, would be, um, it would be absurd in a sense. And if you can make out the person to be a tyrant, um, then you can clothe yourself with the mantle of the earlier revolutionaries, the revolutionaries against Charles I in 1642 and obviously against uh, James II in 1688. Um, 
But as I say, you've actually got a Hanoverian on your hands rather than a Stuart uh, absolutist. Mm -hmm. But um, my sense is very much that Britain um, should have spotted uh, that America by the 1760s and 1770s was ripe for self-government. I mean, of course, we didn't actually give self-government to anyone, and it was largely down to the American Revolution uh, before the Canadians got it in, uh, in 1830. And that, as I say, was, was down to the defeat in, uh, in America. But um, you had 2.5 million population, you had a burgeoning economy running at 7% uh, year-on-year growth, um, you had as many bookshops in um, Philadelphia as in any city in the empire apart from London, and you had no external threat from the French after the Treaty of Paris. The nearest French army was in Haiti, a thousand miles away. And so uh, it made perfect sense for America to become independent. But the trouble was that you, secession always, up until that point historically, in every country that you can think of, mm. led to bloodshed. You know, there wasn't a moment until 1905, it's the first time that a, a, a country's colonies, in this case it was Norway and Sweden parting, um, did so um, without bloodshed. And I need, hardly need to say in, in Virginia, um, the effect of, of secession, the way in which, even of, in, in the 19th century, uh, the uh, attempts of, of 13 states to secede leads to bloodshed. Mm. And, uh, and that can't be blamed on George III. You know, that is just a, a, a fact of life of the 18th century, I'm afraid, and later. So I've got a fun dedication in my book uh, saying when you read chapter 13, remember you're reading it as a British uh, citizen. Uh, and that is, of course, where you deal with the Declaration of Independence and the fact that uh, Jefferson uh, makes this very personal. Yes. Uh, much of the Declaration of Independence, other than the famous uh, three paragraphs uh, at the beginning, are charges leveled against George III. Uh, but we do, even in England, talk about the king's two heads. There's the crown and there's the actual person of the monarch. Now, Jefferson undoubtedly personalized it. It's perhaps his less uh, sympathetic side. That he, you know, he was a great hater uh, and did personalize a lot of his political opposition. But uh, I knew when he accuses, say, George III or holds him responsible for the slave trade, which was not included in the final document, clearly he knew George III had been born long after the slave trade. He's really talking about the crown, and didn't they have to, in order to break away from England, having already denied the authority of Parliament, didn't they have to make this kind of cutting the last umbilical cord? Yes, definitely. By, by mm. July 1776, the war had already been going on, mm. of course, for, uh, for 14 months. Mm. You know, people had died at Bunker Hill. A lot of people had died. Mm. And there was simply no way that they could carry on with this, by they, I mean the founding fathers, could carry it on with this, um, this sense that they were just fighting the parliamentarian army, as they called it. Um, it, it wasn't that. And, um, and so the next stage came, inevitably, that uh, you needed an ad hominem attack on, uh, on George III. And of course, this did come five months after the publication of Common Sense, where Tom Paine had, had very much gone for the king and for the concept of uh, monarchy. Mm -hmm. And it was a tremendously um, popular, sold something like three million copies that uh, over the course of the 18th century. So um, intellectually and uh, in terms of what you need for propaganda in a war, mm -hmm. um, the Declaration of the Independence was a hammer blow and an extremely, uh, I mean, written in language that is sublime, that is, that is Shakespearean. Um, the first third of it makes you proud to be human. Um, and then the second two thirds contains these 28 charges against, ad hominem charges against uh, George III, um, only two of which actually hold water. Um, the 17th, which is about uh, taxation, and the 22nd, which is about Parliament's rights to uh, veto American legislation. And those two, in and of themselves, justify the American Revolution. 
justify the decision to become an independent country. But lots of the rest, frankly, when you when you read them in the in the light of history, I mean, there's one about transporting people across the oceans um, for trial. George III didn't transport any American across any ocean at all for trial. Uh, lots of them were ex post facto rationalizations of the things that had already happened in the war. And lots of them uh, accused him of things that had been around since, uh, well, you look at the Navigation Acts, they were brought in by Oliver Cromwell. Uh, mm. And others go, go back to Elizabeth I. Mm. So mm. they were not specifically, you know, George III um, mm. orientated. But taken together, and, and as I say, written in this, in this beautiful language, um, they do sound like um, an extremely impressive indictment against somebody who uh, Jefferson famously said was unfit to be the ruler of the three people. You do at one point describe him as Churchillian, as a war leader, which is, of course, fascinating as the, one who's written on Churchill. And it, it was a term incidentally also used by Herbert Butterfield, the Cambridge Don uh, in a book that is probably known by very few academics, but it was intriguing because he was writing that in the 1940s. It's a particular speech that he gives in yes. 1772 mm. to his cabinet. Uh, mm. So so it wasn't a public speech in the way that Churchill, mm. obviously, with his broadcast and so on, mm. was very public. In fact, it, he, he brought, when he saw the war going wrong, mm. uh, and by 1779 with the both the uh, French and the uh, Spanish and uh, having come in against the uh, British and the Dutch about to as well, he brought them all to uh, to Buckingham Palace in the in the June of that year, and and really sort of tried to bang heads together and uh, and say look we've got to really reorganise this um, this war and uh, and otherwise we're going to lose it, mm. and uh, and that's what I describe as as Churchillian. Yeah. I he was the longest lived monarch uh, almost until the current queen, uh, one of the longest reigns, uh, of course, for 10 final years of that, which we're about to talk about, he was not actually king, uh, it, was, it was a regency, um, but it was a golden age, was it not, in British terms and cultural terms with Dr. Johnson, Reynolds, and he was one of the great patrons of the art, possibly the greatest uh, since Ch Charles I. Yes, that's right. That's mm. another um, important aspect mm. of what I was trying to do with this book was mm. um, the line in, in Tom Paine's Common Sense that uh, talks about the royal brute of Britain. Um, actually, this is the man who founded the Royal Academy, who whose uh, library of 80,000 books uh, forms the kernel, the center of that stack, of course, at uh, the British Library, those five mm -hmm. stories of books, um, who uh, the planet Uranus was named after because he had helped, he had find out, helped finance the largest telescope in the world for, for uh, William Herschel. He uh, played for musical instruments. He brought Haydn and uh, Handel and Mozart to um, England. He was somebody who had uh, built up the Royal Collection. He bought half of the paintings in the Royal Collection, which today is the largest uh, art collection in um, private hands in the world. And, and of course, Georgian architecture. He was one of, the, um, uh, one of the major patrons of Robert Adam and Sir William Chambers and uh, James Wyatt and so on. So, you know, the idea of him being a brute is completely ludicrous. He was actually a tremendously cultured figure. And along with other kings, like uh, perhaps Charles the, uh, Charles the First as well, uh, another disastrous king, by the way, uh, he, um, he was probably the most cultured of our kings. Um, and therefore, much misunderstood on that ground as well, it strikes me. He had a sort of apotheosis in later life and suddenly uh, became extremely popular in Britain and known as Farmer George, uh, and was almost seen as the John Bull, the personification of Britain. How did that happen? Well, I think Farmer George helped enormously. Yes. It's, uh, it started off as a, as a sort of negative um, phrase, the intellectuals sort of uh, 
uh, who intellectuals who never appreciated and always despised George the uh, Third just dismissed him as Farmer George. But actually, showing the genuine interest in farming, in agriculture, which is where some eighty percent of Britons took their livelihoods in the late eighteenth century, was was not a bad thing. He wrote uh, articles for um, for journals about. Uh, about uh, crop rotation and manure and things like that, which obviously no king had ever done before or indeed since. Um, and, uh, and he used to go around um, just dressed as a normal English country gentleman, uh, talking to people who didn't know that he was the king because he didn't take any entourage with him, uh, to talk about uh, you know, the price of pigs and things like that. And when they found out later that he was the king, um, it, uh, that was something that um, that tended to make him feel approachable and uh, and uh, and personable. And uh, by the time of his great uh, jubilee, his uh, golden jubilee in 1810, he was uh, he was genuinely much loved um, mm. figure. Um, of course, by that stage, people had forgotten, or at least had put to one side, the catastrophe of the American defeat. They were much more concentrated on the. Napoleonic Wars that were being fought at the time, and which he um, was very instrumental in uh, ensuring that we continue to fight regicidal and atheistic France. Mm. Um, these uh, um, yeah. lots of the other con- countries in Europe fought for fifty months. Um, Austria fought for one hundred eight months, and uh, and Britain fought for two hundred and forty two months. Uh, he, he recognised how important it was. And the fact that he was also very modest in his lifestyle and very moralistic, uh, unlike the age in which he lived, uh, he was very fond of his wife. It was a very good yes. relationship. Uh, yes. Does this in some ways capture, I know people hate to talk about the rise of the middle class, but no. that's essentially what's happening, that he's appealing to a new middle class uh, yes. in rejecting all these aristocratic That's norms. right. Well, first of all, he rejected mm. the, the Whig oligarchs and the, mm. and the fact that they ruled, the way in which they'd ruled mm. Britain for the last 80 years. Uh, and secondly, as you say, he had this, this um, really extraordinary and totally unusual mm. um, attitude where he loved his wife. Um, and he was he was in the love only with George a, to do so. The, oh, no, the only Hanoverian, absolutely, yes, yes. to uh, to uh, to be in love with his wife, to be faithful mm. to his wife, mm. to take no no mistress or anything like that. Mm. He met his wife, um, Queen Charlotte, in um, six hours before he married her. That was mm. the first time they met, and they went mm. on uh, to so so it could easily have been a complete disaster like all of the other Hanoverian um, like. But they discovered they had lots of things in common, like music and philanthropy and reading and so on, and uh, and the opera and um, and going to concerts and things. And they fell in love with one another, mm. and it was a it was a very touching, really rather moving love story, um, until his illness uh, struck in 1804, and they um, and they couldn't live together because he, he, he became uh, violent and. Um, and uh, abusive, and you know, he had this terrible, uh, terrible madness, and uh, and it destroyed the marriage. They had fifteen children um, with uh, with one another, and um, and up until that point, for the first forty-four years, as I say, it was a truly loving marriage. So I want to get on before we open this up to the illness, yes. uh, uh, the famous madness. King George, which is the subject of the movie yeah. of Alan Bennett. Yeah. Um, you know, I hadn't kept up with the literature, so this was very, I was aware that there had been a change in thinking, but this was really quite a revelation to me in your book. Um, and uh, I had read a book uh, called George III, the Madness. Mad uh, Business. Yeah. And it was written by mother, son, psychiatrists. Uh, yeah. Uh, McAlpin and Hunter, yeah. and I found it very persuasive. They said he died. Well, what his illness was porphyria, which is a hereditary uh, disease, and uh, they gave this marvelous genealogy back to Mary Queen of Scots, uh, 
Robert Schenk was in the family. What I found shocking in, in what you uncovered uh, and the medical work that you used was the very weak grounds and the holes in this uh, earlier study. And you're basically saying it was manic depression. Definitely. Mm. It was the bipolar um, uh, type mm. 1 affective um, mm. manic, um, manic depression. And what's really shocking, I think, and it's all in the app mm. appendix of my book, I sum, in, sum it up in mm. five or six pages, is that this, um, this mother and son team, um, mm. the Calpine and Hunter, essentially gave totally misleading symptoms to mm. the doctors in the late 1960s. Uh, trying to push them into this um, diagnosis of porphyria, which it just doesn't fit in. And um, it's quite a lot of it, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, is to do with the color of the king's urine and feces. Um, so uh, I don't want to go into it in massive detail, but um, nonetheless, I do in the, uh, in the appendix. But there are also other uh, symptoms to it that, the, uh, that McAlpine and Hunter made a huge amount of that um, simply were um, uh, just impossibly misleading and, and, and wrong. All of the modern opinion since uh, about 2010, um, and so my book is, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, it's the first major cradle of the, to the grave life of uh, George III for half a century. And mm -hmm. so there's plenty of opportunity really to, to you know, just get rid of these these ancient myths, one of which is porphyria, and um, and apportion it to uh, to the what he genuinely did suffer from, and all of the modern medical opinion um, agrees with that. And the other thing one can do, of course, is that um, that's happened since the early 1970s. Indeed, it's happened very very recently, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know and and disgracefully recently really in a sense um is that we have finally managed to destigmatize men mental illness um and so george iii can't be blamed morally for having gone mad you know he went mad because he had this uh, this manic depression and uh, and the things that the doctors did back then of course you know they didn't know about uh, about mental illness uh, uh, really at all and they they would um, uh, straitjacket him for hours on end, it's days on end sometimes. Um, they would uh, attach him to a chair that they nailed to the floor um, and, and uh, to, to keep, him, uh, um, keep him under control, even when he was perfectly sane. He had, he had um, uh, moments when he would be sane for hours on end, but he was... He was uh, still attached to his chair. Um, they cupped him, which is a really awful thing. Where you get a you get a glass, you stick it on a um, on a thigh or an arm, and then heat it up so it brings up uh, blisters and um, uh, it was um, and bruising deliberately to so a man who's suffering from manic depression. Um, and uh, and he was bled a great deal as well. And of course, all of these things just made the whole situation much worse. It did him no good whatsoever. Um, and uh, and now we can see, uh, and he was incredibly brave through it as well. He, he sort of put up with it. Um, he was a very courageous man anyway on at various sort of key moments of his life, like the assassination attempts on him and the Gordon riots and so on, the invasion threat in 1779. But I think he was at his bravest when he uh, was the helpless spectator to his own mental collapse. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you, and, and there was also a moment when he had cataracts and went blind in 1804, when they put leeches on his eyeballs. Um, and the, 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 the courage required for that, I think, must have been just truly extraordinary. This does uh, raise the question as to his mental stability during the revolution yeah, exactly. and whether it had any impact uh, yeah. and also why was it episodic i i would have thought and this is exposing my own ignorance no, that, that i mean the, the, these attacks seem to have occurred in very specific episodes and yes. i i always thought of this as a condition rather than something that uh, yes no yes. It, it, mm. this is very interesting mm. the um uh, it had no effect at all on the American Revolution. 
because his prodrome attack was in 1765. And the next major incident, the first major incident, was in 1788, which was five years after America became independent. So it didn't have anything to do with the American War of Independence. These were moments where he was under extreme stress. And the times actually when he um, was not stressed in 1801, 1804, and, uh, and then again in 1809, sorry, 1810, um, were the times that he had his, um, his attacks. And they went on for four months in 1801, five months in 1804, um, and then for 10 years from the day after his uh, Golden Jubilee. And so, so, it, it, so it doesn't seem to have an episodic um, connection to stress or any of the other triggers that are, um, are commonly understood to affect it. And you might just want to tell the audience before we open this up, what actually happens in 1810? Yes, well, they, uh, when he um, suffers from what all the other historians have said was his fourth attack, but which I believe was his fifth attack, um, he, um, they then had a regency that was brought in. Uh, his completely dreadful, appalling son, uh, the Prince Regent, uh, later George IV. In the three years that I spent uh, researching and writing this book, I couldn't find any redeeming features about his, uh, his son, George IV, um, apart from possibly an aesthetic taste. That was literally uh, it. Um, an aesthetic taste for, um, for um, paintings that, uh, that he bought on other people's money, essentially. Um, he became Prince Regent. And so the king then went to uh, Windsor Castle and spent the, I can't pretend for a moment that the last chapter of this book is much, um, is, is very jolly. And <laughs> it's the fact that he, um, he had gone blind by this stage uh, and deaf and um, senile and, and also mad. So those last 10 years were, uh, were truly sort of tragic, uh, pathos uh, laden period. And was he largely a Kew during that period? Or? Oh, Windsor. 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 He was yeah. in the, the apartments at Windsor. He'd been mm -hmm. moved from Kew to, yes. to Windsor. Well, I know Andrew, like me, believes that the Q&A with the audience is the best. I've got a lot more questions, so if people are uh, still wanting to think, I'm happy to ask them. But I think we've got a number of uh, questions. Yes. Yes. Um, I disagree with you, um, I'm afraid. Uh, I think that we spoke earlier about the caricaturists and the, and the satirists and the, um, and the press. If Queen Charlotte had been biracial, which I think is what you're trying to uh, imply, I promise you that one of them would have written about it at some stage. Uh, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that she was not um, the... Uh, um, the German Protestant princess that she had uh, has always been uh, made out to be. This has been written about at some length, uh, including in articles, uh, indeed an article and an interview um, of me in the New York Post uh, two weeks ago. And if you're interested in going into the nitty gritty about it, I'd be very happy to give you all the details. Uh, so I had the pleasure of a, um, a rather special tour. Of, I think it's Q House, is that right? And it, it, it was described to me as really one of the most housing towns of King George and Queen Charlotte, but I don't know if that in any way comports with your research. Yeah, that's very much uh, the past. Uh, that, that's where they were happy, um, happy together. Um, they. Um, they, that's where they brought up their children, and uh, and of course with fifteen children, one of whom I said, as I pointed out, was a beast, but the other fourteen were rather lovely um, and good-natured, and he was a good father, and uh, so 
So that, 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 that's where his um, happiest times were. Um, and of course, it's where uh, Queen Charlotte later went to, to live. And ultimately, that's the bedroom in which she died. Um, and uh, and so yes, it's it's not exactly the house as it was. Um, there was there was a, another series of houses nearby where she and a lot of the family went to, and it wasn't where he was kept in the initial uh, 1788 uh, madness attack. Um, but it was the, um, the 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 family home when uh, when the children were growing up, and it's a lovely part of London as well. Isn't it? Thank you so much for uh, uh, for coming to Monticello. This is wonderful. Um, I, I thought your anecdote about uh, uh, George III being a be having played baseball, but George Washington having not was uh, was a uh, was a fun uh, uh, se se sentence to work into your early chapters. But um, one of my favorite scenes that you laid out was uh, John Adams going through. Um, uh, George III's library and almost I, I the way I felt you were painting the scene was he almost was taking a step back and looking around and thinking this is this is the best library I've ever seen uh, and it it that combined with 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 the extent to which you you wrote about these essays which you came upon and I'm curious what this process was like from a reach from a research standpoint my understanding is that some of this material, you may be one of the first scholars looking at this work other than the archivists. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about your own experience going through these essays, what they mean from the standpoint of just a world leader writing these essays. They, they seem unbelievably unique from the standpoint of, uh, of, of, of just being raw material that a head of state could, could create um, uh, as being whether in our arguments, even going so far, and not to belabor a long question, but um, you had you had mentioned at one point that George the Third had written this this really comprehensive essay um, uh, 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 against slavery. Um, yeah. So anyway, I've, I've yeah. got two sentences from it, which yeah. I'd love to read. If that's uh, yes, this was. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, that's a great question. In uh, the 1750s. Um, George III wrote a essay uh, on Montesquieu's essays on the laws, in which he he was Prince of Wales at the time, in which he um, said this about the about the slave trade and about uh, all the arguments in favour of slavery. What shall we say for a European traffic in black slaves? The very reasons urged for it will be perhaps sufficient to make us hold such practice in execration. For an inhuman custom, wantonly practiced by the most enlightened, polite nations in the world, there is no occasion to answer them, for they stand self-condemned. And George III never bought or sold a slave in his life. He never invested in any of the companies that did that. He signed the legislation that abolished slavery in 18... Uh, sorry, it's the, the, abolished the slave trade in 1807. And, uh, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, he deserves, and this is, as you say, the first biography that points this out, because uh, up until that, this point, that essay had not been um, uh, mentioned in biographies of him, that, um, you know, he was a, an unusual figure from that, uh, for that period of, of time, and, uh, and deserves uh, some, um, some commendation for that, I think. He, he makes another point, though, to me, still deserves thinking about uh, that the British Constitution should have checks and balances. And That's of right. course, in a way, yeah. it really does not now, uh, with the very weak monarchy and very weak uh, monarchy, House, very of weak Lords. House of Lords. Uh, exactly. No, exactly. Um, the, no, the, the mm. checks and balances, uh, um, especially if you have a very weak opposition, mm. which you most certainly do at the moment <laughs> in, uh, in Britain, um, it does allow executive power to be much more closely concentrated than it was mm -hmm. um, in earlier times. Certainly in, in uh, Queen Victoria's time, for example, when a, a strong House of Lords, a strong opposition, a strong press, uh, indeed, mm 
uh, and a and a strong-willed monarch meant that prime ministers could get away with an awful lot less than they can today. So, uh, some of the watershed moments in the relationship between Britain and the United States. And I was curious um, which of these you thought was the most dramatic and which, if, if at all, do you think that the revolution could have been forestalled by George? I don't think it could have. No, I think uh, for reasons that I gave earlier, I think America was on the correct uh, historical development path to independence. And, uh, and the founding fathers spotted that. Uh, as I say, the, uh, the French threat was, uh, was flung off the North American continent by 1763. Uh, it was the right thing for America to become independent, as was seen, of course, by its subsequent uh, development in becoming the most powerful nation in the world by the end of the 19th century. So I, it strikes me that um, the king who has been uh, blamed for 200 years for making error after error. Actually, if you look at them, many of them were made by, by Lord North and the, um, and the cabinet. But ultimately, unless they were going to make the offer that was made to the Canadians in 1830 of complete um, self-government within a Commonwealth, um, which didn't exist, that concept didn't exist. The Commonwealth concept didn't exist until the American War of Independence. It took the American War of Independence to create the Commonwealth concept, which since has actually proved Britain tremendously well, especially after uh, Australia became a, a uh, dominion in 1900, uh, New Zealand and so on. So, um, so in a sense, he is blamed for not embracing concepts that didn't come into existence until half a century later. I also think one of the great missed opportunities of his reign was not really the loss of America, which as Tom Paine and Adam Smith predicted, would actually work out for the benefit of both countries. Uh, they'd be doing more trade than before. But actually, his opposition to Catholic emancipation in Ireland, which you deal with, I think, extremely well, but it is one of the great missed opportunities. You had a Tory conservative government willing to bring Ireland into uh, a formal union with Britain, but with Catholic emancipation, with Catholics voting. And he essentially preferred to force out his favorite prime minister, William Pitt, uh, who was committed to this, uh, and um, insisted that it was contrary to his coronation oath, and yet he'd signed off on the Quebec Act, which gave Catholics, uh, some formal uh, recognition in Quebec, uh, lesser known as the island of Grenada, where by royal prerogative, they allowed Catholics to sit in the assembly uh, in the 1760s. And you mentioned the Catholic Relief Act. And you, you do give very good uh, circumstantial yes. reasons. But I mean, as late as no. uh, the First World War, it nearly yeah. brought Britain to civil war, That's this right. issue. Yes, uh, it was. No, mm. it was. You're quite right. Um, it, historically speaking, mm. now we can see that that was a terrible missed opportunity. Mm. But if you mm. put yourself, as historians always have to, uh, mm. in the in the position of George III mm. in 1801, when this is uh, when he suddenly bounced mm. into this by mm. uh, Pitt the Younger, you have to remember a certain number of things. And firstly, of course, he was not a Protestant bigot. Um, mm. He mm. he was the first king to visit Catholic homes and stay at. Uh, at various Catholics at houses and so on. Mm -hmm. First king since the Glorious Revolution 80 mm -hmm. years earlier. Um, but he did recognize that the only reason he was sitting on the throne was because he was a Protestant. Mm -hmm. And uh, George I was the 51st in line to the throne, but he was king because, uh, because of the, um, the Glorious Revolution against uh, the Catholic uh, James II. He had, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, seen the Gordon riots up close and personal. These were anti-Catholic riots of 1780, uh, which caused the largest amount of devastation in Britain between the um, Great Fire of London and the Blitz of 1940. And, uh, and so he had, he had um, you know, personally witnessed that. He was very brave during it, in fact. Mm. Um, and this coronation oath 
did matter to him. You know, he had made this oath uh, in front of the Lords and Commons um, in Westminster Abbey, saying that he would protect the Protestant religion as by law established. And he didn't feel that there was any kind of uh, support for, um, for overturning that, because although Pitt the Younger and Dundas and uh, Castlereagh and probably another three members of the cabinet supported it, the majority of the cabinet didn't, the majority of the House of Lords and House of Commons didn't, uh, and the majority of the government didn't. So it would have required him to have put his sort of constitutional monarchy hat on um, to one side for the first time in his um, in his career. And he wasn't willing to do that. And uh, as you say, of course, in the long term, it was a tremendous missed opportunity. But he also, I suspect, wondered what would happen were you to uh, enfranchise uh, hundreds of thousands of Catholic Irish who would be voting uh, on the side of the radical Whigs and thereby upset the balance in, in Westminster as well. Um, so it's very important, as, as you know, terribly important to try to um, put yourself into the into the the place of somebody 200 years ago it's one of the most difficult things that any historian can do and one of the most exciting and intellectually vigorous so we're beginning to run out of time now, but i think we could take one or two final questions I'm gonna take a Yes, I'm afraid this is a complete myth. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, 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 yes, no, I go, I go into this in, uh, in a couple of pages of this, uh, of this book. Uh, I'm afraid I simply don't believe that it, it went down in the way that it did. Um, partly, of course, in June uh, 1785, actually there's another quotation I'd love to give you. It's, uh, again, only, only a couple of uh, sentences. In June 1785, when... Um, when uh, John Adams goes to the um, uh, audience with the king in uh, the private audience as the first American ambassador uh, to, uh, to London. And the king says to him this, um, I will be very frank with you. I was the last to consent to the separation, but the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I've always said, and I say now, that I would be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. And um, which I think was quite big of him. And of course, 15 years later, he later also said that George Washington was the greatest character of the age. So I think we, we can establish that he was not uh, pathetic and small minded and petty about uh, about Americans. There is no indication at all uh, that I was able to find or that any other historian has been able to find that he read the Declaration of Independence. Um, but there was every reason to think that he would not want to meet Thomas Jefferson um, socially at, uh, in an audience any more than I can imagine why Thomas Jefferson would want to uh, meet him. But the level, the, the uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's account in his autobiography many, many years later um, breaks down on two or three straightforward factual um, points about where he was, when he was there, who else was there, and so on. And as I say, I do go into this. And my sense, my strong sense is that instead of being rude and turning his back on, on Thomas Jefferson, actually it uh, was not like that at all. And that people, especially in their autobiographies half a century later, can um, remember things uh, with, uh, what's the Shakespeare in terms of, with advantages. Um, and uh, and I think that's what happens on this occasion. But please, ladies and gentlemen, right. read your read read right. my uh, my take I, on this I and would see just what you think. Play devil's advocate. You must do, not <laughs> least because we are at Monticello. After uh, all. Is uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, that's uh, right. I, I got into the belly of the beast. <laughs> the tradition was also on Adams's family, and the real thing was, and Jefferson wasn't known as the author of the Declaration of independence he made that 
not an issue when he was in party politics in the 1790s, but he was so pro-French and dressed in a very French style. You can see the Mather Brown portrait uh, and that. Uh, he certainly wasn't at a love day, but he could have been at a drawing room and got the detail wrong later, but we won't get in. You do make the case. Uh, he does, though, make one very amusing, almost affectionate comment about George III towards the end of his life and said that George III should be in our pantheon of heroes because he drove us to our own good. <laughs> and so I'm going to suggest he should be on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and, and on I mean, that belt bombshell, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. This Thank is you very much. Splendid. Andrew. That's Thank great, you. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.